I don't know about you, but I just can't get enough of the non-canonical Gospels. They're just so fascinating in themselves, they offer so many questions and what-ifs, they nuance our understanding of the earliest days of the largest religion in the world, and they also teach us how religions and traditions like this develop over time and in conversation with its time and place. In previous episodes, we've explored the Gospels of Thomas, Judas, and Mary, and since Christmas season is approaching again, I thought it would be fun to dive into another one of the lost, often termed, quote-unquote, Gnostic Gospels. And this time, we're going to look into the one that has, by far, the greatest name of them all, the Gospel of Philip. A very strange and complex text that often defy any clear categorization into, you know, belonging to one group or another, and which has themes that are sometimes very familiar to us, but at other times shockingly different from what we're used to in other Christian texts. So, let's dive into the Gospel of Philip. A bit of self-promotion before we start. Um, have you ever wondered what all the music on this channel comes from? Well, actually, the majority of the music is actually made by me, and a lot of that music is available on Spotify and all these different platforms and, and stores. And today, I'm actually releasing a new single called Isthmus with my project Zini. So if you're interested in my music and the kind of, uh, kind of music that I make, then definitely go check out that song. It's on Spotify, it's on my other YouTube channel, Philip Holm. Uh, it's in most of those places where you'll find you know, music in the streaming, where you can stream music. So please, if you feel so inclined, go check out the song. If you like it, then you know, spread the word, share it. Um, let me know what you think of the song. Uh, and yeah, um, back to the video. The Gospel of Philip is a so-called non-canonical gospel, which means it is a text that was copied, spread, and read by certain groups of early Christianity, but which did not make it into the canonical scriptures of the Bible or the New Testament. As a result, many of these texts eventually lost popularity and were lost to history for millennia, existing only as myths and mentions in other writings. That is, until the 1940s, when the so-called Nag Hammadi library was found in Egypt. A treasure trove of ancient texts that had survived in caves and which, for the first time, gave us first-hand writings from lost groups like the Gnostics, the Valentinians, and the Thomasine Christians. This discovery is what has revolutionized our understanding of the diversity of early Christianity and given us some truly fascinating texts, some of which we have already explored on this channel, such as the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary. And among this fascinating group of texts, there is also the mysterious Gospel of Philip. A text which can be hard to categorize, but which has become famous worldwide by showing up in pop culture, such as in the Da Vinci Code. Its fame primarily stems from a certain juicy section or quote, which we'll get to later. But first of all, what is this text, who wrote it, and what's it all about? Well, there are some significant uncertainties and mysteries surrounding this text. Like many other texts from the Nag Hammadi library, it is written in Coptic, the Egyptian language, but has been translated from an original Greek. So we think that it was written in Greek originally, and because of certain uses of Syriac terms, some scholars think that it might have been written in Syria, possibly sometime in the late 2nd century. So compared to some of the other texts we have explored, this one appears pretty late, in other words. The text is structured in a pretty interesting way. Um, it's called a gospel, but it's not a gospel in the traditional sense, as we know the gospels from the New Testament, in that it is not a, an account of the life of Jesus and his teachings in that way at all. Uh, neither is it like the Gospel of Thomas, which is just a collection of sayings by Jesus. Instead, the Gospel of Philip is like just a collection of paragraphs and, and short sections about various different topics. Um, sometimes the, this gospel can feel kind of disjointed. Um, you know, the theme b between the paragraphs can be very, you know, it can, it can be hard to see any, any kind of clear thread between them. But there are certain themes that recur, and when you sort of dive deeper into it, you can see some of these, these themes recurring, and that there is a kind of internal, um, there's an internal logic to the text, but it's very much a kind of collection of different paragraphs and short um, sayings and, and and teachings, sometimes very esoteric teachings, and so on. 
Jesus shows up in the text, but there are only about 15 sayings of Jesus in the entire thing. Like I said, the individual sections seem pretty disconnected sometimes, albeit perhaps unified by certain themes, which has led many scholars to consider that it might not be originally a unified work, but rather precisely that, a collection of quotes that have been taken from other sources. As for who wrote it, that is also a point of contention, and quite a mystery. It wasn't written by the disciple Philip, of course, and Philip is only mentioned once in the text. Rather, Philip might be a kind of composite figure, according to Scapello, that symbolically represents the teaching of this gospel in some way. It's clear from the text that it did not come from the group that we sometimes call the Proto-Orthodox. In other words, those Christians whose theology would eventually end up as the mainstream. Instead, the text shares many features with various other groups, making it hard to attribute it to any single one. Many have argued that its doctrines are rather Thomasine in nature, thus perhaps coming from the same group represented by the, the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, on the other hand, there are many other features that are decidedly so-called Gnostic in nature, as well as others that are more Valentinian. The role of Mary in the text also reminds us of the Gospel of Mary and how it portrays her. So the text could originate with any of these groups really, or perhaps, given the nature of the scripture, perhaps it contains bits and pieces from multiple sources. The most popular consensus is that the text primarily functioned within a Valentinian context, but it's definitely still open for discussion. Now, the Valentinians were a certain group of early Christians uh, founded by a guy called Valentinus in Rome, he was a pretty prominent figure, he was actually up for becoming the Bishop of Rome, in other words the Pope, but uh, sort of just missed out on, on that um, position. Uh, and they became known for their very unique doctrines. They are closely connected to the so-called Gnostics, um, or the Sethian Gnostics, which is what I refer to as Gnostics usually. Um, there are similarity in teachings with the Gnostic, but they're also quite different in other ways, so it's, it's hard to sort of just equate the two. Um, but so yeah, that's the Valentinians. It's an important early group of, of Christians that had significant differences in their I, sort of doctrines and ideas compared to the so-called proto-orthodox, which would become the mainstream or orthodox later on. So what does this gospel say? Well, in a general sense, we could categorize it as a kind of esoteric text, or at least a text concerned with esotericism and esoteric doctrines. There's a kind of dichotomy presented between those who are in the know, so to say, the ones that have access to the true doctrines and interpretations of the Bible, the in-group in this case, and the other, the apostolic Christians, who are misled and misinterpret scripture and Jesus by reading things too literally. This other, quote-unquote, misled group clearly represents the so-called proto-orthodox, who are misappropriating the message of Jesus. They are even referred to in a derogatory way as Hebrews in the text. Quote, some say Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. They are wrong. They do not know what they're saying. When did a woman ever conceive by a woman? Mary is the virgin whom no power defiled. It is a great anathema to the Hebrews who are the apostles and apostolic people. So by saying that, you know, when did a woman ever conceive by a woman, um, they're commenting on the fact that the Holy Spirit grammatically is, is female, right? So that the Spirit would be a female that impregnates a female, and that sort of makes no sense, so that's the point that's being made here. So already this indicates what kind of people the text was aimed at. One of the groups of Christians at the time that were concerned with gnosis, or true knowledge, as the way to salvation. Now this doesn't mean that it was written by the Gnostics, as in the Sethian Gnostics, but that it shares that common doctrine that we find in many non-canonical gospels, including those by the Gnostics. In other words, that salvation comes through the true knowledge, or gnosis, that Jesus taught, and not necessarily through his death on the cross and his resurrection. In fact, the text seems, like the Gnostics and Valentinians, to hold to what is known as docetism, in terms of their Christology. This means that they believe that Jesus wasn't actually human at all, but fully divine, and that it only appeared like he had a human body. Quote, Jesus took them all stealthily, for he did not appear as he was, but he appeared as one that could not be seen. But to each of these he appeared. He appeared to the great as great, he appeared to the small as small, he appeared to the angels as an angel, and to humans as a human. This also means that the death and suffering on the cross doesn't play a major role in this theology in the way that it would in mainstream Christianity. 
Instead, just like in the Gospel of Thomas or Mary and the Gnostic Gospels, it's all about knowledge, gnosis. Quote, the one who has knowledge of the truth is free, but the free person does not sin, for the one who sins is the slave to sin. Knowledge is the way to salvation, that is, knowledge of our true selves, and in that self-knowledge become united not only to that higher self, but with Christ and the divine itself. Madeleine Scapello says, quote, One of the major themes of the Gospel of Philip is the reunification of soul and spirit in a heavenly union that realizes the identification of the soul with its true self. This theme of union is a recurring theme in the text, and it is always in conversation with a kind of inherent duality that runs through the entire thing. First of all, we seem to find references to the characteristically Gnostic dualistic cosmology. So in the wider category that is often referred to as Gnostic, although I am skeptical and careful with this term since it is a modern categorization, we find a recurring cosmology where there is a clear distinction between the physical, material world and the spiritual, divine world, referred to by the Sethians, who are the ones I refer to as Gnostics, again, as the Pleroma, or entirety. In fact, the physical world and the body is even seen as something very dirty and evil, as a kind of prison that needs to be escaped. This is indeed an overarching theme in many of these schools that are sometimes clumsily referred to as Gnostic, including the Sethians, the Marcionites, and the Valentinians, although there are, of course, also nuances and differences among them regarding this too. This cosmology has a dramatic tale about the true hidden god, which is called the Invisible Spirits by the Sethians, and the Father by the Valentinians, from which emanates a number of different eons or eternities, divine principles representing different attributes like wisdom, logos, truth, etc. At some point, though, one of these eons, often the one called Sophia, wisdom, conceived in secret of another kind of being of her own, which becomes a deformed creature that is cast out of the divine Pleroma. This ignorant, sometimes evil, or at the very least, a sort of unrelentingly just being, is referred to with names like the Demiurge, meaning the craftsman, Yaldabaoth, or Saklas. And he is the creator of the physical world, along with his archons or rulers. In other words, the physical world that we live in was not created by the true God, but by this ignorant pseudo-deity, who of course created a flawed and evil world to be escaped. This is also identified as the God of the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, who gives you know, the Ten Commandments to Moses and so on. And we find clear traces of these doctrines in the Gospel of Philip. For example, quote, The world came about through a blunder, for the one who created it wanted to create it imperishable and immortal. He failed, and he did not achieve the objective. For the imperishability of the world never came to be, and the imperishability of the one who made the world did not exist." Clearly referring to the Demiurge and his flawed creation. But there is also talk in the text about another kind of duality, namely the inherent oppositions in the world that create tension and strife. And this duality is perhaps primarily represented in the text uh, through the imagery of the male and the female. Quote, If the woman had not separated from the man, she would not have died along with the man. His separation became the beginning from death. For this reason, Christ came so that he might rectify the division that came about from the beginning and again join the two, and so that those who have died in the division, he might give life and join them. The world is full of such oppositions and dualities, not only male and female, but good and bad, up and down, inside and outside, etc. The perfect human, the principle of humanity which exists in the Pleroma, was androgynous, and it is only in this world that the human is separated into male and female. This reunion of male and female also probably refers to a reunion of soul and spirit, psyche and pneuma in Greek, to their original state of union in the true divine self of the human. At the same time, this might also be a reference, or certainly seems to be connected to, the common idea in Gnostic cosmology that the divine eons in the Pleroma are usually conceived of as existing in male-female pairs. But just like in many other so-called Gnostic texts, if we can call this one that, there is an emphasis on the ugliness of this world, the prison from which we must escape. 
Unlike the other Christians who interpret scripture literally and misunderstand Christ's message and the nature of the world, the true community knows the esoteric truths and aim to escape the world and body, instead clothing themselves with a body of light and live out a spiritual existence. Quote, This world is a corpse eater. All things that are eaten die as well. Truth is a life eater. For this reason, none of those nourished by the truth will die. Jesus came from that place, and he brought nourishment from there. To those who desired, he gave life so that they might not die. Like we said, this is achieved through the teachings of Jesus, particularly the true esoteric teachings conferred to select people, and involve some kind of union of dualities and ultimately a union with the divine itself. In some way, these dualities that we have talked about, male and female, psyche and pneuma, should be united once again. Quote, While the union dwells in this world as male and female, the place that is strong and weakness, in the entirety the image of the union is different, although we refer to them by these names. But the others exist. They are exalted above every name that is named, and they are exalted above the mighty. For where there is strength, there those chosen for power dwell. They are not different things, but both of them are this one single thing. This talk of the reunion of the opposites is one of the recurring themes in the text and sometimes takes on romantic and even erotic imagery. Indeed, following these themes of male and female uniting, one of the most characteristic terms and concepts in the text is the idea of marriage and the so-called bridal chamber. Quote, But the woman is joined to her husband in the bridal chamber. But those who have joined in the bridal chamber will no longer be separated. These references have puzzled scholars. What does this bridal chamber refer to? Is it some kind of symbolic language for some kind of union with the divine? Or is it referring to something more practical, some kind of ritual maybe? In fact, one of the most striking aspects of this text is that it seems to mention some kind of sequence of, of sacraments even, like some kind of ritual or rituals in some way. Now, we don't know anything really about Gnostic or Valentinian rituals, like how the Valentinians actually practice their form of Christianity, but in this text, there seems to be a mention of some kind of sequence of rituals. Quote, The Lord did everything in a mystery, a baptism and a chrism, and a Eucharist and a redemption and a bridal chamber. Not only is this striking in the sense of using baptism and Eucharist as sacraments or rituals, which are certainly more associated with Orthodox Christianity, which this text and those like it seem to reject so strongly, although it seems pretty clear that they interpret these rituals in some different ways. But it's also striking in invoking this bridal chamber among such rituals, seemingly indicating that it too involves some kind of practice, maybe even some kind of sexual one. The idea that these quote-unquote Gnostic groups performed some kind of sexual rituals was often used as a kind of argument by their enemies to discredit the movement. For example, in his classic text Against the Heresies, Irenaeus says, quote, For some of them prepare a bridal chamber and perform a sort of mystic rite pronouncing certain expressions with those who are being initiated and affirm that it is a spiritual marriage which is celebrated by them after the likeness of the conjunctions above. We simply don't know exactly what this bridal chamber thing actually means in this text. Um, the gospel mentions it several times, it's one of the most recurring themes in the entire text. Uh, and it seems also to indicate that it is the sort of highest achievement, the highest spiritual achievement on this you know, path or in this tradition or whatever. They actually use a kind of allegory in the text, comparing these sacraments, these rituals, with the temple in Jerusalem, which has sort of... Uh, increasing or sort of maybe descending or ascending levels of, of of holiness right so so the first baptism is sort of the outer courts of the temple and then chrism is like you go into the next um, room and then further and further in and the bridal chamber is represented by the holy of holies right this the holiest part of the temple where only the high priest could enter and where the you know, not, of course, in Jerusalem, but where in other places, like, the actual image of the god would be housed in, in this most inner sanctum, right? So the bridal chamber seems, to, in this allegory, is like the, the, the most holy, the most sacred uh, and profound um, peak of, of the spiritual, you know, maybe experience or path or whatever is going on here. 
I think that this imagery certainly has something to do with divine union. The whole text talks about the dichotomy of male and female and how these dualities are to be unified, and imagery of kissing and marriage are clear indications of the male and female uniting, a symbol of the marriage and union of the divine Pleroma, with the sexual act in the bridal chamber being the ultimate consummation of that unity. It seems that the bridal chamber thus represents perhaps the highest mystical experience, a kind of union with Christ or with God, which represents the end of the journey. It is possible though that this may have also been some kind of a rite at the same time, as many passages and outside sources seem to indicate. So this is the ultimate aim of the practitioner, to turn away from the material world and body and somehow reach a kind of unification with his true self in the divine realm. Quote, there is no other way that someone will be able to produce for himself this grace unless he should clothe himself in the perfect light and also become the perfect light. This is how one becomes free, and is the true meaning of the resurrection. Of course, a group that view the material world in this way wouldn't hold the idea that the dead will be physically resurrected at the end of time. Instead, true resurrection happens spiritually, and in fact, can take place in this life. Quote, what is the resurrection? It is necessary for the image to rise through the image. It is necessary for the bridal chamber and the image to come through the image into truth, that is, the restoration. And, quote, those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. If they do not first receive the resurrection while they are alive, when they die, they will not receive anything. In other words, the resurrection of the dead is something that takes place here, in this life, and spiritually. It is the awakening to the divine life, a resurrection from being dead, as in being in this false, um, maybe evil, or at least sort of flawed world and body, to awakening and being resurrected, restored in the divine realm, which is our true home. That is the true resurrection, and only then will we receive, you know, our reward when, we, when our body dies eventually. These are all of course fascinating and striking themes, but the most famous aspect of this gospel by far is of course the way that it talks about the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Right? Um, it, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, Mary, just like in the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip seems to portray her as being somehow the favorite disciple of Jesus, that she is the sort of foremost disciple whom he liked more than anyone else and who he, whom he gave sort of the, the deepest truths and the most full truth to in some way. The text mentions three different Marys, but indicates that one is quite special. Quote, Three women always walked with the master. Mary his mother, his sister, and Mary of Magdala, who is called his companion. For Mary is the name of his sister, his mother, and his companion. What does the author actually mean by the word companion here? Is it simply something equivalent to a disciple or companion in that sense? Well, a section later on seems to clarify this and makes a statement that may appear shocking and controversial to many. Quote, the companion of the Savior is Mary of Magdala. The Savior loved her more than all the disciples, and he used to kiss her often on her. And here we have perhaps one of the most frustrating lacunas in history. The very last word in the sentence is missing, so we don't know what it is that Jesus used to kiss. Many, including Marvin Mayer, have chosen to translate it as to kiss her often on the mouth, and this has become a very popular interpretation, which would be quite striking indeed. If this were true, along with the rest of the passage, which indicates that she was his companion, and that he loved her more than the other disciples, seemed to many to indicate that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had some kind of romantic relationship. Now, putting aside mainstream Christian theology, this is of course entirely plausible. A Jewish man of that age would have been expected to be married. Indeed, it would have been weird for someone like that to not be married at that time. But taking into account Christian theology and Christology, this is of course quite problematic in many different ways. Even within an internal Valentinian or Gnostic theology, it doesn't make all that much sense, given that they hold the Docetist view that Jesus wasn't actually truly human. 
Others have translated the passage differently as kissing her on the hand or the forehead, but given the sentences preceding it, it still poses quite a striking question about their relationship, so how should we interpret it? Well, this puzzles actual scholars on the topic, so I won't pretend to know better than them, of course, but I do think it is worthwhile considering the wider context of the text and its themes. As we've seen, we find the recurring theme of kissing, marriage, and the bridal chamber as symbols of divine ascent and symbols of divine truth. It certainly seems that these passages indicate that Mary Magdalene had a special role among the disciples as the foremost one who inherited the true teachings of Jesus, which, like we said, is a theme in the Gospel of Mary as well. And while leaving the possibility that Jesus and her had a romantic relationship totally open as a possibility, I think we can probably read this passage in a symbolic way too. Indeed, in another passage it says, quote, People are nourished from the promise of the heavenly place. If they would be, and there's a gap here, from the mouth from which the word comes, they would be nourished from the mouth and would be perfect. The perfect conceive and give birth through a kiss. That is why we also kiss each other. We conceive from the grace within each other. Here is a clear indication, to me at least, that the true teachings of which the gospel speaks are conceived or transmitted perhaps in a way through a kind of sacred kiss. With this in mind, I think it's quite plausible that the passage talking about Jesus kissing Mary possibly on the mouth can also be an indication or symbolic way of saying that he conferred special knowledge or gnosis to her especially considering she was supposedly his favorite among the disciples. Whatever the case, the Gospel of Philip remains one of the most fascinating and puzzling of the non-canonical Gospels. Not only for these famous passages about Mary, but also for its unique language and imagery involving marriage and the bridal chamber, as well as the way that it seems to draw from, or at least have similarities with, different schools of early Christianity at the same time. From the Sethian Gnostics to the Valentinians, Thomasines, and the authors of the Gospel of Mary. Most scholars attribute it to a primarily Valentinian context, and I am ready to at least carefully accept that idea, but it is certainly a text that once again shows us the great diversity and intellectual melting pot that was early Christianity and all its different schools and movements. It may not have made its way into the canonical Bible, but it can surely still fascinate and inspire us today in the contemporary world. Thank you, as always, to all of my patrons who support this channel and keep the channel going. None of this would be possible without you, and I will never tire of saying that, so thank you all so, so much. Might as well take the opportunity to give a special shout out to everyone in the Saint category, the highest tier at my Patreon. Um, both old and new, some of these aren't even active still, but I would still like to just mention all these people because they've been uh, supporters uh, at one time or another, and which is so highly appreciated. So thank you so much, Wasif Khan, Wael Mohammed, Thomas Blaise, Oleg Kirovsky, this guy with all the numbers and letters, Sohail Gokal, Faris Badawi, Mary Carmen Ordones, Wael Osiris, Marcel Westerbeek, Ahzan Zahid, Nicholas Kano, Prophet's Apprentice, Abdul Qadir Shakur, Nash Return, Ahmed Sevki Altin, Khalifa El Gama, Khalid Rosa, Brian King, Emilio Dominguez, Fawaz El Mubariki, Jordan Friedman, San Kalp, Yara Amar, Jean Sarquin, Dolly, Christopher All, Coins, Flement Brax, Sam, Moreno Nurezade, Awo Ifagbami Shangogbami, excuse me if I mispronounced that, Jeffrey Ins. Kimia Meshkimiar, Nadia, Leo, Tyson Dancy, Abdullai Pangasur, Carlo Dicellico, I think, John W. and Boi Chen. Thank you all so, so much for the support. I would highly appreciate, of course, if anyone else wanted to become a patron, this is the best way to support this channel and this mission of giving you free educational content on the world's different religions and philosophies and, and uh, cultures and so on. It's a project that I'm very passionate about and I really appreciate all the help that we can get uh, in that sense. So please check out uh, the Patreon page, I will leave that in the description, or you can leave a one-time donation through PayPal as well. Also, don't forget to check out my new song, Isthmus, with my project Zini. It's available in all you know the streaming platforms and so on. I will leave links to that too in the description if you are interested. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.